we stopped here this morning. Um, so, quick recap: what we saw is that if you form the, um, if you discretize your OCP using multiple shooting, so you have all these uh, shooting gap constraints and all the these red dots, which are uh, discrete states inside your problem, um, and then your um, can go through that very quickly again. So the NLP looks like this with the shooting gap constraints and the inequality constraints. And um, so when you want to solve um, the, um, the NLP using SQP, for example, and you will have all these matrices inside your problem. So the Jaco Jacobians of G and H and this matrix H, that's going to be a vector and these are vectors as well. So the structures they have don't really matter. But these three matrices, H and uh, these Jacobians, uh, are important uh, for, uh, in, in terms of how expensive the QP is to solve. Uh, so we saw that uh, Jacobian of G has this uh, shape, Jacobian of H has this shape. So in terms of sparsity pattern, uh, do you all understand this plus, by the way? Just checking. Yeah, OK. So. When it's white, it's zero. When you have a dot, there is a number. Uh, so yeah, this Jacobian is bended with this very specific structure. This Jacobian is bended with this specific structure. It's actually block uh, diagonal, this one. Um, OK, and uh, we still had to talk about the, um, the Lagrange, uh, or the Hessian of the Lagrange function. So essentially, this matrix here, which uh, often is approximated, but not always. Uh, but if you use the exact Hessian, uh, the shape it will have if you discretize the problem using multiple shooting. So recall that the Lagrange function, you can write it as a sum of uh, functions that depend only on, uh, on the primal variables at the time stage k. So this w is basically x k u k. Yeah? Um, and when you form the, la the, the Hessian of the Lagrange function, Essentially, every element in that uh, Hessian will be basically uh, second order, order derivatives of this L with respect to uh, couples of, uh, of uh, primal variables. So this Wi, Wjs could be uh, parts of the states and parts of the inputs. And of course, since L is uh, the sum of these functions, we are really talking about taking the Hessian of this L cage with respect to these different variables. Um, and so because this LK depends only on the WKs, of course, when you form uh, these things, uh, th these Hessians with respect to these variables, uh, these elements are zero uh, if you have uh, terms with i and j different, and also different than k. So essentially, Long story short, if you take the Hessian of your Lagrange function, it will be made of uh, blocks uh, on the diagonal. And each block is essentially the first of this Ls, the L0. Uh, and you take the Hessian with respect to W0. Because anything else would be 0. Huh? If you differentiate L0, W0 with, with respect to W1, for example, well, L0 does not depend on W1, so you have a 0 here, and, and so forth, and so on and so forth, actually 0 here, and so on and so forth. Um, so if you unpack this, you quickly realize that uh, your Hessian of the Lagrange function has to be block diagonal with these blocks here, all the way to the end. So this, this is really coming from the separability of the Lagrange function, so the fact that you can write L as a sum of this uh, subfunction. Yeah, there is one thing to be careful about. That's uh, an important remark. This works as long as your uh, cost function uh, and also the inequality constraints operates uh, in a stage-wise fashion. And a counterexample of that could be that um, your phi, um, instead of being, uh, for example, something like this, So a sum of uh, the costs, um, or a sum of cost function operating on each stage, so stage 0 to n minus 1. So that's OK. But if you start having something like, for example, that blends in 
uh, states across the stages, for example, something like that. Why not? The fact that this cost is blending k and k plus 1 will create issues, so you will lose this structure if you have this. And same for the constraints. Huh? If you have some constraints uh, that uh, blend in uh, stages, something like this, for example, or UK, UK plus 1, then you can also lose that structure. Does, it, does that make sense? So if you have this, you cannot separate the, the Lagrange function anymore. You cannot write it in this form. And then you will start having uh, elements outside of the diagonal here. Um, yeah. So if you have problems where you would have to write this, uh, these things here, there are ways of transforming your costs and constraints such that you stick to this kind of structure. Uh, it's always, I think, always possible to uh, recover the structure but you need to play a little bit with your, uh, your problem. Um, yeah. And so it may or may not be crucial that you have this kind of uh, structure in your Hessian. It really depends on uh, what tools you use for um, solving your QPs. So if we come back here, what tools you use to, uh, to deploy your SQP. Um, <coughs> now I'll discuss a little bit about that, uh, but maybe just to uh, guide you already where where this is going. Um, for the specific structure that we just saw, so these banded matrices and block diagonal uh, Hessian, you actually have QP solvers that are specifically designed for solving QPs having that specific structure. And these QP solvers are, uh, are uh, designed for speed. So when you have uh, problems having these sparsity structures and that one, you have specific QP solvers that will be extremely fast at solving your problem. And as soon as you throw in something different, so you don't respect this structure, that structure, and that structure, then you cannot use these tools. Um, so when you go for real-time applications, uh, it really matters that you try to preserve uh, these kind of structures. If timing is less important for you, then it's not so important that you have a different structure. Then you would call a generic uh, purpose solver and it will still be able to handle uh, your problem and it will typically be able to uh, use the sparsity, <coughs> sparsity of your problem. All right, so that's the picture. Huh? So uh, in this example, um, yeah, in this example, uh, so Jacobian of the equality constraints, that's the shooting constraints, inequality constraints, uh, block diagonal, Hessian block diagonal. So these matrices you have in your QP, which will have to be uh, manipulated by a linear algebra solver. They are very sparse and structured, and the linear algebra can be optimized for these structures. Uh, so that answers the question before, is does it not create problems to have all these constraints and variables in the problem? The uh, answer is no if you are using tools that can exploit these structures and the sparsity of these matrices. Uh, then you have large matrices but sparse. It's not such a big deal to work with them. Any question on that? No? Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned some solvers, they try to uh, estimate the Hessian or uh, approximation of the Hessian. Yeah. Does, does those, do those solvers uh, take care of the structure? Okay, um, so <coughs> um, let's put it that way. So the solver will use the Hessian you want. Uh, it's a basically your choice to tell the solver uh, uh, use my exact Hessian or use an approximation. You have to provide it yeah, typically you have to provide the Hessian. You, you may not see it depending on which uh, um, code you use. Some they would do things in the background. You don't even know what they are doing. Uh, but if you use solvers where you, you have control on, on what's happening, you will be able to specify which uh, Hessian you want to use. Um, 
And then it really depends if, if the tool is exploiting the structure in a very specific way, like for example, this uh, multiple shooting structure, then it will really care about uh, the structure you pass. And actually these tools are uh, designed for, um, for um, solving QPs arising from, uh, from multiple shooting. Um, you cannot even, I can go back to it again. Typically you cannot even uh, pass a structure that is different than that. Typically the, the way you communicate to the solver then is that you, you give the, the blocks you're not allowed to pass anything else. So it's actually by construction assuming that you have this structure. That's very, very common in uh, all these uh, fast QP solvers for uh, optimal control. Now if you use a uh, more like off-the-shelf solver, uh, I'm thinking about IPOPT for example, uh, then IPOPT will be actually calling uh, off-the-shelf uh, linear algebra solvers like LAPAC and so on. And these guys, uh, you can pass anything you want as matrices, but then they will, uh, they will basically spy on your matrices, uh, uh, register the sparsity pattern, uh, find the pivoting to bring it to a good structure for a speed, and then memorize this and then use it over and over again. Typically that's what happens. Even MATLAB does this nowadays. Um, so in that case, it's less important that you have the right structure. Having said that, knowing that the exact Hessian is banded, uh, it would not probably make much sense to give a Hessian approximation that does not have this structure. You're not supposed to have non-zeros outside, outside of that. So if your Hessian approximation does not look like that, then it's, uh, it's a bit fishy. Um, yeah, speaking of that, uh, when we talked about SQP and Newton, I think, uh, I mentioned the BFGS approach, I don't know if you remember. So BFGS is basically trying to approximate uh, the Hessian numerically by essentially doing numerical derivatives essentially. Um, and BFGS tends to return a dense Hessian, so it will actually have numerical noise creating non-zeros out outside of these blocks. That's nonsensical in, uh, in a multiple shooting context, you're not supposed to have non-zeros outside of that. Uh, and in that context, BFGS is a bit ruining the um, efficiency of the linear algebra because you'll tend to pass dense matrices to your uh, linear algebra solvers and uh, they're not supposed to be dense. Um, so yeah, if you use these techniques, you should try to fix that, like maybe flush out the non-zero elements where they're not supposed to be or something like that. Any other question? All right. All right. So, um, okay. So we basically had an overview of multiple shooting. Um, there is one thing that uh, would be useful to discuss now. Um, so we basically said uh, we had kind of a computer code that runs a simulation or even when you use multiple shooting you need to build these little simulations on these little time intervals uh, that you pass to your solver, this FXKUK uh, that you have in the constraints. And I said in the beginning these things are basically just simulations or integrators um, and that's the end of the story. Well, it's almost, almost there but not yet because it's, it's really a good idea to discuss uh, how you build these little things and uh, how you can do it wrong because uh, you may have some surprises here. Um, so <coughs> what I'm going to talk about is basically questions that are below these boxes mostly but when we will talk about that one we'll see that it's kind of the same story. Um, so we'll be working mostly uh, below these boxes and so the question here is how you build this simulation essentially. Okay, so that's the menu. Um, and I'll try to explain where I'm going with that. So once again, the picture, if we use, for example, multiple shooting, uh, and let's assume for now that I don't have inequality constraints, uh, just to make the picture simpler, but it will not change anything in the story if I had. <coughs> 
Um, so you have your Ws, that's the collection of uh, discrete states and discrete inputs. And your constraints would have probably boundary conditions, you may have initial terminal conditions, whatever you would like. Um, and then you have your, uh, your shooting up constraints, right? So that the simulation at the end of the first interval matches the next one and so on and so forth, right? So closing these little gaps, these are these constraints here. And so these functions f that I will throw inside my uh, constraint functions, they are simulations of my system, right? It's a function that receives an initial state x0 and a constant input on that interval u0, simulates my dynamics, my ODE, and returns this, uh, basically what comes out of this simulation, right? So this f is an integrator of the OD over time interval tk, tk plus one. Um, so it's a computer code, of course, uh, but you can view it as a function. Now let's uh, remember, so when if you, if you deploy SQP or Newton or anything to solve your NLP, solve this thing here, um, you will have to rely on these things. For example, uh, if you form the QP problem, uh, you need to rely on the Hessian of the uh, Lagrange function or some approximation of it, this gradient, and uh, the Jacobian of your constraint, so Jacobian of this list of functions. Then you calculate w delta W, update the variables, go back to one, and so on and so forth. Uh, so we should discuss a little bit what happens with this thing here. So how do you build this Jacobian in your QP solver? Um, and so where the story is going is essentially I'll have to differentiate G. G comprises simulations, so I'll have to differentiate my simulations. And that's possibly not obvious uh, how to do that. And there are ways of doing that wrong. So we need to differentiate uh, these functions F and these functions F are computer codes. Okay with that picture? Cool. Okay. So this f here is an integration of the OD. That's my OD, possibly. That's uh, this continuous object. Um, and if you think what would happen in the computer, for example, in these three shooting intervals, you have your constant inputs, u0, u1, u2, and uh, possible uh, uh, discrete states, x0, x1, x2, and then your uh, computer code will basically run this simulation. So, don't see it yet, but this is essentially uh, many, many, many points that uh, hold the trajectory of this system all the way to the end of this interval. So, if we zoom on one of these uh, little uh, little simulations, we could have a picture like this, for example. Uh, you see here the, the integrator like taking small steps in the beginning, then it steps a bit faster, then it takes small steps again here in the end for some reason. Essentially, it's a collection of uh, discrete points that will uh, approximate your, uh, your OD uh, accurately enough. So now the question is, uh, how do I compute this uh, Jacobian? So essentially, when I want to differentiate G, and that's going to be a derivative with respect to W, so that's all the states and all the inputs. I will essentially, in this operation, need to differentiate my functions F with respect to the initial conditions and the inputs I feed into my simulation. So in that case, that will be essentially if I move my XK, how will the end of the simulation react to that? And if I move my UK that we don't see in this graph, how will this endpoint react to that? So how do we compute these things? Okay, with a question we are trying to investigate. Yeah. Okay, so there are different ways of doing that. Um, uh, something I'm missing in the slides, but it's good to say it. Uh, the two first approaches are actually the same, but uh, it's really not obvious from uh, the equations. But I'll, I'll still show you both. Um, so the first one is called the uh, variational approach. Um, and that's the most uh, obvious thing you can do to, possibly to uh, 
to uh, differentiate your simulation. Um, so I'm going to use this extra notation S to just describe essentially uh, this thing that evolves from xk to xk uh, plus one, so or to the end of the integration. So xk is my initial condition for the interval where I'm integrating. And then I have a trajectory s of t that lives here on this interval. So this s is basically describing this little tail <coughs> that uh, I'm following in my multiple shooting. Uh, and s is defined by this really. So s uh, respects the DODE and starts at xk. And uh, this function f that I have, so that's the end of my simulation. That's what I would return to my, uh, my solver. Is really just essentially the end of, uh, of the tail. Okay, uh, if for example we define a matrix A function of time, that is essentially trying to describe how um, this S will move around as I move around my XK. So if I change my initial conditions to down here, that will move the entire trajectory, and each of these points will be moved a little bit. So if I wonder at a given time t, how is this s uh, moved by moving my xk? That's what I'm trying to capture in that matrix uh, A. So then if I can calculate my matrix A, then the question of how does the end of the simulation move with respect to the initial conditions, that's than my matrix at uh, time tk plus one. So the A at the end, so describing how this point reacts to changing the initial conditions. And what's gonna happen is that uh, I can actually write a differential equation that uh, defines uh, my matrix A for all time. Um, if I write A dot, that's basically the over dt of this uh, thing here. And under some easy conditions, I can sw swap, um, swap the derivative. So essentially put the d over dt in here. I'm not talking about d of s dot over xk. And s dot, I know what it is. That's my f. So I can do that. And then I need to differentiate f of s by xk. I can chain rule that. So I do del f by del s, del s, del x. Right, it's just basic calculus. And this is uh, A again. So essentially, I'm saying, well, A dots is this Jacobian matrix evaluated, evaluated on S of T multiplied by A. So I actually have a linear ODE with a time varying uh, matrix here uh, that describes the evolution of these sensitivities. Does that make sense? Yeah. The initial conditions, um, how s of tk changes with xk. Well, s of tk is xk, right? That's the beginning of my trajectory. So I'm essentially asking, what is that? That's identity. So essentially, I have an ODE that describes um, my matrix A of tk. It starts at identity, and then I have simply this uh, would be to integrate. <coughs> so you can very easily write this down uh, in a code. Uh, so the sensitivity of uh, your simulation with respect to initial conditions is given by A at the end of your simulation. And A is defined by, uh, so you need to run, or you need to um, create your trajectory S of T and uh, once you have your S of T, you can integrate this, uh, this ODE here. It's a matrix-based ODE, but that's, that's not a problem. Started at, started at I and uh, following this uh, differential equation. So once you know your S of T, uh, this document matrix, you can evaluate that at every time instant. So this would be a time-varying matrix uh, once you know your S of T. And S of T is provided by the, the simulation itself. Okay, with that picture? <coughs>
the so, is yeah. the, the Jacobian on the bottom line, the, the RF, is that one given by just uh, taking the Jacobian of the um, of the model of the dynamic function exactly with respect to x exactly okay. so yeah that's a very good question so how do you compute del f del s yeah so you take your model equations really like the equations giving you x dots and uh, you differentiate that with respect to the states that gives you a matrix with a lot of expressions possibly in there but if you plug in s for the state at a given time that's a numerical matrix and you can use it to evaluate this and at every time instant, uh, you recalculate uh, this Jacobian on, dif on different S of T's and uh, you can process this integration. And the way you would implement that typically is that uh, when you form a simulation of, uh, of uh, your little tail um, to evaluate uh, the simulation of your system, you would integrate this guy and this guy together. Right? So the integrator would uh, have as a state S and A and uh, this guy would kind of live on its own but you can run this uh, the, the the integration of a at the same time so you can try to code that is fairly straightforward okay with that okay to get the sensitivity sensitivities with respect to the inputs it's not very different it's the same tricks uh, you can define a matrix b of time that's the derivative of the trajectories with respect to the input. Here, u is constant. Uh, and then at the end of the simulation, b at final time would give you this sensitivity. And then it's the same story. So b dot is the over dt del s del u. I swap the derivatives. s dot is f. So I can plug it in. And then I do a chain rule. I have to be a little bit careful here. I have the direct influence of u on this function f and the influence of u on s and s on that function so del f, del s, del s, del u so now I have two terms actually that pop out um, these things are, I can evaluate them uh, when I know my s and this guy is b again so I also have uh, a linear od for b with these guys being uh, time-varying matrices that I can evaluate on my trajectories. The initial conditions. Um, so the initial condition of the trajectory is fixed. It's given by xk. So if you move the input, this point will not change. The input will impact the later trajectory. So your b is zero on the initial condition. So again, you have a, a, a differential equation that builds B and you can do it at the same time as you uh, process your uh, your dynamics. Okay with that? Yeah. So you could can code these things essentially. Uh, that's the way it would look like uh, as an integrator with uh, with variational uh, sensitivities. Um, you would have is you will process all these things together. So your integrator would hold all these states S, A, and B s uh, the dynamics will be given by your model the dynamics of a is del f del x times a and the dynamics of b is del f del x b del f del u with these initial conditions um yeah mm -hmm. and actually if you um, some of the uh, famous off-the-shelf uh, integrators like uh, cvod and these things if you call sensitivities on these integrators, they would usually do that. They would just append uh, equations to the integrator and give you back these sensitivities. Yeah. Do you do this every iteration of the SQT? Yeah. And in every, uh, every interval, right? So every of this simulation, TK, TK plus one, would be simulated with that. Does it make sense or should I elaborate? Maybe I should elaborate. <laughs> um, so if you go back to the big picture, um, your trajectory will be made of uh, these things, right? You can remember the pendulum example where you have that. So this is one simulation. 
And in that simulation, I need to simulate that way. So I simulated the dynamics to actually build that thing here. And S at the end returns my, uh, my discrete function, f of x k u k. And um, at the same time, I will integrate these matrices. So all this stuff happens in the integrator as I proce uh, proceed to, uh, to on my simulation. I get f, and I will get del f del x and del f del u from the a and b matrices. That's one time interval. Then next time interval, I, I do the same stuff again on this time interval and so on. And I do all these simulations, and that allows me to build the QP. Then I can get the, the step delta w, update all the variables, and I do everything again. All right. There's a lot of work happening uh, in order to uh, generate this uh, QP step. Huh? Yeah. yeah. You can uh, choose your favorite uh, integrator or do an arbitrary discretization of the discretization. Yes. Uh, exactly. So that's the, the interest of these variational approaches. If you have an integrator that works well, uh, you could, in principle, just plug these equations in here and differentiate your integrator. There is a bit of a catch around this. Um, I'll try to explain that a little bit later, which is not completely obvious. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so the integrator would, once you've integrated your trajectories, then uh, S at final time, A and B, would return uh, the function and its derivatives with respect to X and U. And that's another story. Um, if I have time, I'll uh, discuss that. Uh, building the Hessian is typically very, very expensive for, um, for um, uh, multi positioning approaches. You can, in principle, create uh, variational equations for the Hessian as well. You would have uh, a lot more uh, things to handle. But what is this used for? Well, so you need these guys in the first place to just get the delta G in the QP solver, right? Uh, I'm not yet talking about the Hessian. Yeah. So you could imagine you may be using a gauss newton hessian approximation, which actually uh, allows you to not compute the, the, this, the Hessian of, this, of the simulations. Um, so you could skip that in, in some cases, but this one you can never skip. You need to provide these sensitivities to your solver. Um, yeah, there's a pro, so you just mentioned that before, so you <coughs> can in principle throw this in your favorite QP um, integrator and get, uh, and get your sensitivities. Um, this one uh, is a bit controversial, so let's, let's not uh, discuss that right now. Um, yeah, and uh, the idea here is essentially you would first, essentially first uh, differentiate your problem. So you're basically looking at your dynamics and differentiate them and then discretize the equations. So in the sense of integrating them. Uh, what I want to show you next is that you can look at the problem the other way around. You can first look at uh, what the discretization of these dynamics look like and then differentiate that discretization instead. Uh, but before I go there, uh, yeah, we can look at this, for example. Um, okay, I just wrote a very simple OD. It's nonlinear, uh, but it's just one state. And here I'm using uh, the famous OD45 from MATLAB, uh, integrating over five seconds. It's a stable system, so it's fairly simple um, to handle it. Um, yeah, and you have, uh, yeah, you have this effect actually. Um, so I'm using uh, a very, very fine numerical differentiation as a baseline for my sensitivities. Uh, but you see here as, uh, as the integrator tolerance is, uh, is uh, relaxed. So that's like a coarse integration, a very accurate one. The sensitivities themselves also become less accurate. So you have an effect of the integrator uh, um, numerical error uh, 
in, uh, on uh, how accurate your sensitivities will become. I hope this picture makes sense to you. So essentially the fact that you process these equations uh, in the integrator itself, the equations are exact per se, but uh, the integrator is inexact. So you also generate some error in the sensitivities from that effect. Yeah, okay, that's a really important thing, actually. Uh, it's not just about integrators. Um, so, <coughs> what happens if, um, if, you're, um, if you feed uh, sensitivities that have numerical errors into your NLP solver? So, if you remember, if you do SQP, for example, uh, you would uh, generate your QP steps or your, your steps in the variables by doing that. It's always the same equation. And so let's say we have just uh, equality constraints. So what happens if uh, you, the matrix you generate here at uh, the different uh, QP steps, if this guy is a bit approximate, so it's, it's not bad, but it's not very accurate. Um, do you know what happens if you do that? Yeah. It's very, very symptomatic uh, when you do that to uh, a, um, an SQP method. So let's imagine, uh, just to make it simple, that I have just two variables, w1, w2, and let's say that the solution is here. And maybe I start my, uh, my SQP method uh, over there. So if you feed slightly wrong sensitivities, uh, what you will see is that uh, it will converge very nicely in the beginning and seem to go very well. And if you remember your Newton and SQP theory, once you get close to the solution, you would <coughs> normally converge even better. Like you reach this quadratic convergence region, it should just like nail it in a few iterations. Well, if you feed the wrong sensitivities here, coming close to the solution, it would actually start kind of like wandering around without never really nailing it. So you'll see your, uh, your, um, your solver just like struggling at very close to being to be converged, but not getting there. And just like kind of struggling around it. If you see that, it's very, very symptomatic of the sensitivities being wrong, slightly wrong. Um, and what happens really is simpl simply that uh, in you're very close to the solution, so it really matters that you're accurate in the directions that your SQP has to nail the solution. And if you give it noise in here, uh, instead of finding the right step, it will actually always be a bit, uh, like a little bit off and kind of always miss the target if you want. So in the context of multiple shooting, uh, it's actually very, very common to see people uh, making a small mistake here uh, because they may not be very, very clean in generating the sensitivities of the simulation. So you do your, because the del F in your del G are a bit wrong, the old del G is a bit uh, numerically wrong. And then they see the solver like converging very nicely and then it just goes nowhere. Um, so that's uh, something to be careful about. And one way to uh, fix that, uh, if you don't want to go into the details, just make sure that the tolerance of your integrator is, is much tighter than the one you ask for your NLP solver. And if you do that, you'll move this problem beyond the accuracy you ask from your NLP, so you'll manage to converge. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Any question about that? Yeah, I'll try to discuss a tiny bit more of this because there is a bit more behind uh, what I'm saying here. But yeah, we'll get there. Okay, so that's the variational approach in a nutshell. There is a bit more to say about it, but uh, we'll move on to uh, uh, another view of the same question. So the variational approach is essentially you take your, uh, your ODE and you, you build uh, mathematically the sensitivities of the, of the simulation. And then you process these equations numerically in the integrator. Um, the second way of looking at it is called algorithmic differentiation. That's the main approach used in optimization for <coughs> mostly computational reasons. 
so it's just another way of generating the sensitivities. Um, and so um, here the story is instead of differentiating the, the OD itself, you look actually at the computer code that is running the simulation and differentiate that object instead. Um, so if we do the exercise with explicit Euler, for example, mostly because it's very simple, uh, hopefully it's, uh, it's understandable. Um, so here is an explicit Euler integrator, the pseudocode. So uh, you could really run optimization with this. Explicit Euler is not efficient, computationally speaking, but uh, it works. Uh, so, in that sense, the computer code you would uh, use for generating this FK UK is really this. So essentially, it's a code that receives XK UK initial conditions input. It receives the number of steps you want to take inside the integrator. That's not necessarily the same n as the one of the uh, of the NLP, and uh, and possibly the time interval. And so you would have this internal variable s. That's really this thing that carries the trajectory. Uh, you want a delta t. That's the difference uh, uh, over your, uh, yeah, the, the time gap you have here. And then you basically run the uh, earlier updates of, uh, of, your, uh, of your dynamics. Um, I don't know if everyone is familiar with this kind of things. Yeah, simple, okay. Um, so basically run this for loop, replace s all the time with uh, this thing. And at the end of the day, you basically have your simulations. You return uh, S as an output of your function. And from the outside, ignoring that it's a computer code, you could, could, could call this output my F of X and U. So if you want to, um, yeah, it would look like this on, uh, for example, the system. So you make a few steps. These are your intermediate S. You don't need to store them in principle in the code, and if you want to be efficient, uh, you would not want to store them to limit memory accesses. Um, and um, yeah, it's an order one integrator. So if you uh, multiply by 10 the number of steps, you would uh, typically divide the error by 10 as a, a rule of thumb. So yeah, if you deploy that in the context of multiple shooting, yeah? so on each of these intervals, tk, tk plus one, uh, you would generate this uh, one, two, three, four, five, six points um, yeah, within each uh, interval. And yeah, then your, uh, your constraints in the NLP solver would be essentially that this last point which is coming as an output of this code has to match that point. And so the NLP solver does not see that code per se. Have okay, have to move. <laughs> <laughs>